Welcome to today's uh, get together with Harriet Thompson. And um, I'll hand over to Harriet after a very brief introduction. She's done a lot of really exciting things. And, uh, and as we were just discussing has, um, it works at a department that's a mouthful. So I'm going to leave that one to her, but she is an associate professor in global social policy and sociology at the University of Birmingham. And, uh, and has worked at several other places previously and has really done impactful work on energy poverty. The topic today is, um, is very apt in that sense because it's uh, going into the, the different indicators to measure energy poverty in, in particular draws on an article that last I checked had been cited over a hundred times even though it only came out, is it 2017? And it's an indoor built environment um, it's with several uh, colleagues that uh, Harriet has um, worked uh, prolifically with as well. And, um, and so I will leave the floor to you, Harriet. Perfect. Welcome. Thank you, Sid. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that introduction. So, oh, sometimes I have to think about what the department name is. Um, so the Department of Social Policy, Sociology and Criminology. Um, I only fit into some of those parts. I'm by no means a criminologist. <laughs> Um, so can you see my slides okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much for, for the invitation. Um, yeah, I was really excited to, to be able to, to join in with this seminar series. Um, so as Sid mentioned, I'll be talking about um, kind of rethinking the way that we, we measure energy poverty. And I'll be taking a very European focus in this talk, but you know, a lot of the things um, are quite transferable to the context as well. So really just to, to, to start, I need to kind of go back five decades um, to, to the 1970s, during which time, as many of you were aware, um, there was a global oil crisis, which made um, the price of domestic energy really expensive. And this is what led British government officials to coining the term fuel poverty. And this was later developed by Brenda Boardman in her groundbreaking book of the time. Um, and now in the present day, um, you know, across Europe, you can find studies on this issue, uh, although it's more widely referred to as energy poverty. So I thought it'd be useful just to contextualize um, the kind of policy importance of the issue before moving on um, to other aspects. So, um, in this diagram, sort of try to capture um, you know, the, the quite wide ranging direct and indirect consequences of um, energy poverty that I think make it a really important policy issue to address. Um, so for instance, it can lead, if we look at the start at the top, it can lead to households underheating their homes during uh, winter, to them being too hot during the summertime, um, and people not being able to pay their energy bills. So then if we, we kind of look in turn at some of the indirect consequences of that, we see that this can lead to poorer physical um, and, and mental health, to air pollution, um, and also, you know, some kind of macroeconomic issues for businesses and, and governments. Um, for example, if, you know, a significant portion of the population is no longer able to pay for their energy bills, um, this will create some cash flow issues for utility companies. So overall, uh, moving then to the green part, addressing energy poverty, particularly through energy efficiency um, to reduce demand and through renewable energy really creates lots of potential win-win solutions for other policy areas. It can improve population health, it can reduce um, air pollution, and it can, in certain circumstances, lessen political tensions. And in the sort of early European framing of the issue, um, it was very technical. It focused on um, three main factors shown here. So, you know, how efficient the, the building was or the, um, and the equipment contained within, um, the price of energy and um, the amount of income that a household received, and then the kind of interaction between those three factors. So on the one hand, this was really important for emphasizing the role of infrastructure and really distinguishing it from income poverty. So with this triad, we can see that, you know, increasing someone's income um, will only address the issue in the short term, 
but it doesn't um, you know, resolve any of those underlying issues around the quality of housing or um, of high energy prices or high energy costs. Um, as I kind of outlined in, in the, the paper that um, Sid sent along with this talk, um, measuring energy poverty is a really challenging task for, for several different reasons. Um, so the main one being that it is a private condition. You might not necessarily know um, that it exists by walking down a street, looking at housing. It varies over time and by place. And it's incredibly culturally sensitive in the sense that, um, you know, our usage of energy and our relationship with it is socially constructed. Um, and it's very multidimensional. Um, so it really does vary by, um, as I said, sort of those place and, and time. Um, those different dimensions will, will have different importance um, in you know, various different ways. So in combination, that really makes it a really difficult problem to try and, and encapsulate in, in a set of indicators. So in, oh, why is it not one to go? There we go. In general though, there are three key approaches um, that are taken to, to measuring the problem. So the first one really is around the patterns of energy expenditure and trying to estimate um, the burden that places on a, a household's income. Um, so what's known as expenditure based. There's a second approach of you know, asking people, um, do you have access to or can you afford a set of kind of socially perceived necessities? And this can be things like having an, an AC unit, um, having central heating, um, being able to keep adequately warm during winter or cool during summer. And then the third one is around, um, you know, trying to directly measure the problem. So um, using temperature loggers inside, um, trying to work out the amount of light and whether that's adequate and so on with kind of cooling. Of the three, the, the last one is the least used approach, um, though I think as we move forward and we see advancements in um, kind of smart home infrastructures, that is likely to change. Uh, we'll see, you know, much greater usage of time of use tariffs and understanding um, to the exact minute how people's energy consumption is shifting and if there's any external stresses to that. But for the time being, the main approaches are around expenditure and um, self-reported indicators. So in policy terms, um, a small number of European countries have been working to address energy poverty for, for several years now. And probably the most well-known um, and longest standing definition was the UK's 10% definition, which was in use for, for several decades, right up until 2013. And this classified a household as being energy poor if it needed to spend more than 10% of its income um, on energy costs. So that covered everything, not just heating. However, it was widely criticised um, for being sensitive to the price of energy um, and for counting richer households as energy poor. And this included our, our very own Queen, um, who I think we can all agree probably isn't energy poor um, or necessarily as deserving of help as, as other people. So rightly so, there was um, a review of the, the policy approach and a new low income, high cost definition was proposed and adopted for England in 2013. So this introduced a really interesting um, policy divergence where for the first time, the four nations of the UK took a different approach to how they measured the problem. Um, and this is something that's only fragmented even more as we've moved forward. So Scotland had a review very recently and are also adopting a new approach to, to measuring it. Um, which looks at instead minimum income, minimum income standards. So a really pivotal moment for um, kind of breaking up the UK um, approach. Um, here we've also got Ireland, France and Slovakia. They, they've been working um, on this issue for a number of years as well. Um, and in general, that does kind of mirror the approach that the UK took. So uh, Ireland initially also looked at the 10% indicator, um, but in all of these, there's a common kind of focus on, again, those kind of technical factors. 
And if we shift to the to the European level, um, there is no shared definition in place at the moment, and this is despite many, many attempts to, to try and establish one, um, including in the most recent clean energy package, where the European Commission, in fact, proposed a common definition, but this was ultimately rejected during the um, tripartite negotiation stage with the European Council and the European Par uh, Parliament. That being said, um, it is an issue that the European Commission is taking more seriously, um, as are individual countries who now have, for the first time, legally binding obligations to provide energy poverty action plans as part of um, the clean energy package. So we have seen a lot of progress um, just in the last couple of years alone. Um, and there's also been progress in, in sort of moving towards agreeing a set of indicators that could be used in combination for measuring the problem. Um, particularly through the work of the European Commission's um, EU Energy Poverty Observatory, which uh, I was involved with setting up and leading from 2016 until very recently this year. And as part of the observatory project, um, our, a key part of our role was monitoring um, policy progress. So for our last 2020 PAN-EU report, we reviewed all of the national energy and climate plans that had been submitted, um, a few were missing at the time. And we looked at how embedded um, energy poverty was within those plans using the criteria that kind of listed in that table there. So um, we tried to see if uh, the issue was kind of acknowledged in some way, if it was explicitly defined, um, <clears throat> whether that member state had come up with an indicator or a set of indicators to measure it, um, if there were direct policies that were explicitly about energy poverty in place, or if there were, um, you know, sort of related policies on um, tariff and bill support, uh, investing in energy efficiency that's targeted at um, vulnerable households, uh, and other things around, you know, if they highlighted national or regional best practices. So in general, um, we found that member states are at you know, very different stages um, in how integrated energy poverty is within their wider energy policies. Um, and this situation has shifted a little bit since um, uh, an updated set of plans has been submitted. And I think as we move forward, we will see greater momentum around this um, and more kind of national, nationally driven um, efforts to try and, and define it in terms that is meaningful for that country. So yeah, quite an interesting kind of policy backdrop. And, and certainly, you know, in the last, I'd say five years alone, it's been probably more happened than in the previous 20. But I think if someone were to ask whether current approaches to, to measurement are adequate, then you know, it would have to be a resounding no. Um, and this is for, you know, various issues around um, a kind of persistent, uncritical application of thresholds. Um, so thinking especially around the UK's 10% indicator, it has been enduringly popular worldwide. I see it pop up everywhere um, where people sort of take it a 10% threshold and apply it to their data. Um, and in many cases, this, this might actually just be quite meaningless um, because that threshold had a history of referring to, to twice median expenditure among a particular population. Um, so there's some frustrations there. I think you know, we need to kind of think a little bit more critically about what those thresholds represent um, and you know, what it means for the particular expenditure patterns of a country and, and whether um, people are always using formal types of energy. You know, maybe there's a lot of informal use of um, firewood or, or other um, energy carriers that aren't captured in that um, calculation. Um, there's issues around, you know, the dominance of single indicator approaches, um, which just are not capable of capturing that multidimensionality of the problem. Um, and, you know, in conjunction with the fact that the everyday complexities of, of energy poverty um, are often simplified or just altogether um, silenced by the structure and the use of um, different, you know, data sets. 
And this latter point is um, something that myself and Sid, along with colleagues from across Europe, have been um, working on. And at the bottom of the screen there, you can find a joint paper where we explore these themes in, in a lot more detail. So I guess then the question is, you know, what don't we know um, from the data that we have? Um, and in the, the earlier 2017 paper that Sid was referring to earlier, um, we used the energy vulnerability framework by uh, Buzrowski and Petrova as a, a central lens for trying to evaluate European data provision and, you know, sort of conceptualizing what future survey needs might look like. Um, I'll go into detail about that framework uh, a bit later on, but for now, just really to highlight that the four kind of main pan-EU surveys that tend to get used for energy poverty, so um, the Household Budget Survey, the EU Statistics on Income and Living Conditions, the European Quality of Life Survey, and Eurobarometer. Um, they, they really provide quite a, a narrow, they provide a very narrow focus if you were to just use those data sources for, for trying to measure energy poverty. Um, so they can tell you a lot about affordability dimensions, particularly in terms of the ratio of energy expenditure to income um, and a little bit around perceived affordability by households of energy costs. Um, but really they do little to nothing in telling you about individual practices, behaviors, um, what energy carriers people actually have access to and the efficiency of their homes. And of course, we know that uh, COVID-19 is um, disrupting everything. Um, and, you know, this resulting emergency energy measures that have been put in place really have created a radically different policy context for addressing the problem um, in the future. So here is um, a screenshot and a link for um, a mapping exercise that I've been leading in conjunction with um, several colleagues from the Engager project. So Marlies Hesselman, uh, Rachel Gaia and Annie Zvaro. And what this map has revealed is that worldwide um, governments, regulators and utility companies have really scrambled in, in a very short period of time to put in place a variety of different measures to try and mitigate energy poverty by you know, keeping energy affordable and available. So this has um, really ranged from things like bans on disconnections, um, energy sub subsidies, um, personalized payment plans, and as well in, in certain contexts, a reconnection of households who have historically been disconnected from electricity. So there's some really interesting dynamics at play there. And we, we're starting to unpick various kind of spatial trends as well. Um, so for example, within Nordic countries, there's no specific attention given to energy within emergency COVID measures. But of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of income support provided instead. So I think it will be a while yet before, you know, we truly understand the impacts um, of COVID on energy vulnerability. But some of the, the kind of early signs have been very concerning around, um, you know, hugely increased energy costs um, and reliance on, you know, greater reliance on polluting forms of energy. So I think it's fair to say um, that there are many gaps in, in the ways that energy poverty is measured, um, understood and governed. So as part of the, the EU Energy Poverty Observatory that I mentioned before, um, uh, I hired a, an agency to put together a photo exhibition um, with portraits of people who were affected by energy poverty. And through this exhibition, you know, we really want to challenge a number of existing misconceptions that existed about the issue. So our exhibition covered four different European countries including the area of um, around Jokmok in, in northern Sweden. And this is where there's, you know, small remote villages who are kind of scattered around and they're particularly vulnerable to, to failure in the energy infrastructure. Um, so many of the power lines up there are very old. Um, and a couple of years ago when our photography team visited, um, in December, one village had had 
in December, 35 power outages alone. Um, and that's just in a single month. And there are also, you know, a number of wider issues in this area with the way that Indigenous Sami people have been forced to move from their lands um, to make way for hydroelectric infrastructure. We also met people um, living in Budapest and Hungary who face unbearably hot summer conditions. So one family we met lives in a high rise um, concrete tower block in which um, you know, there's no natural shading so they're really high up. Um, and the indoor temperatures often exceed 30 degrees Celsius during the hottest months. So the family shown here, they you know, literally spend every moment trying to avoid the heat and avoiding using electrical equipment or lights, which might add to that internal heat. So recognizing these gaps, the, the theoretical framing and, and academic discourse on energy poverty has really evolved over the last decade. Um, with vulnerability thinking and discussions of energy services used to challenge the narrowness of um, the three drivers prevalent in that earlier fuel poverty work. And from this body of work, we know that energy poverty is a complex multifaceted issue that occurs um, when a household is unable to secure materially and socially necessitated levels of domestic energy services in the home. So researchers, you know, more commonly now emphasize the importance of talking about energy services because as is often said, people do not demand energy per se. Um, they don't demand five kilos of wood or a hundred kilowatt hours of electricity, but instead, you know, we want the useful services that energy provides, such as um, showering, cooking, and heating. And this is a, a social technical term, meaning that, you know, we can't understand it in um, purely technical or social terms. Uh, recognizing that there are you know, these different factors that combine um, and contribute to the provision of um, an end energy service. And this might include things like the technologies available, um, the institutional and policy arrangements in a particular country um, and individual consumer needs. And analyzing, um, well, applying the concept of energy vulnerability means examining the risk factors that contribute to the precariousness of particular um, spaces and groups of people. Um, whereas the, the term energy poverty can be seen more as a, a descriptor of a fixed state in a moment of time. So in that sense, um, you know, an energy vulnerability framework really helps to, to capture and to conceptualize those um, temporal dynamics um, with households who you know, are described as energy poor at any moment in time, being able to exit the condition in the future if some of their circumstances were to change and vice versa, there's a risk that they fall back into energy poverty. So um, using the framework developed by, um, by former colleagues, uh, Stefan Bozrowski and, and Saskia Petrova, we move away from studying that traditional triad of um, income, energy costs and efficiency, and instead look at um, six different key factors, which includes things like um, flexibility. So is a household able to make changes to um, the, the, the fabric of the building around them and the equipment? And there, there may be limitations in place, for example, if someone is a renter, um, and they, you know, might not have the money or, or the, the willingness to make changes to the efficiency of their property. And similarly, there might be that split incentive between landlords and tenants. And it also includes things like a much greater emphasis on needs. Um, so we know that, for example, a household where someone has a disability might have higher energy needs resulting from um, a, a physiological need for a higher indoor temperature or perhaps needing to run additional loads of laundry or having um, equipment that relies on electricity. And similarly, they talk about practices. So the individual behaviors of um, people, how they use energy, but also, you know, the kind of energy literacy in a way and um, whether people are able to take advantage of support schemes that exist around them. So, you know, it's a, a much wider, more comprehensive and I'd say holistic 
way of, of thinking about energy poverty. And I think the reason that this shift to energy vulnerabilities is important is that it fits more cases, you know, it includes people who probably otherwise would just go unnoticed. So, for example, if we return back to, to northern Sweden, um, people in, in, in Jokomak are used to energy being unreliable. And many of them have, you know, these emergency kits prepared in their houses. You know, this can be diesel generators, um, canned food, candles and, and so on. And we met one family, uh, Margareta and Lars, shown here, who are uh, reindeer herders. And um, they told the story of how a few years ago they were out for um, a hunting trip. They're away from their home for um, a short while. Um, and they were out without electricity for, for several weeks in one go. And they lost all of the meat in their freezers. And obviously this had, you know, huge economic impacts for their for their own business. So the thing that we often argue to policymakers, particularly from uh, Sweden, is that, you know, even though people are living in in very nice houses in one of the most equal countries in the world, this is energy poverty too. And it, you know, we really need to include that in our conceptualization. So I'll end on on that point um, and just say, you know, thanks very much for listening through to that and you know, definitely stay in contact with my email and also my Twitter address there. So thank you. Thank you, Harriet. That's uh, it's hard to do um, clapping <laughs> on uh, online, but uh, it's a very useful um, overview and um, and the way we like to do this is a bit different now because we can't use classrooms, unfortunately. But um, but I have a, a bunch of things I would love to talk to you about. Um, but if anybody has any questions, just feel free to either type in the chat or just um, unmute yourself. Uh, you can feel free to put on your audio and video and uh, ask Harriet yourself. But um, if you're typically yeah, Thank you so much for, for the presentation. I learned a lot and I was really missing this, uh, bringing all these concepts together. But uh, still I'm thinking about one thing from experience. I come from Mexico. In some places, there was once a president who gave like uh, TVs to the people who didn't have electricity access. But I also know from some colleagues from Nigeria where they put uh, electricity access, but the people don't have the durable goods to make the proper, as you say, like to actually derive the service. But I haven't seen any definition or any uh, outlook on energy poverty that actually looks at the, at the household infrastructure to, to finally decide whether the person is, is poor or not. For example, in, in Mexico, I think the index changes from, from few percent because energy access as in the supply side is very, is, is, is almost okay. But when you look at the machinery, it's thirty six percent. So I, I wonder if this is a, a, something in, in the energy poverty scholarship. You can yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and yeah, it'd be good to catch up separately around what you're doing in, in Mexico. So I'm working with a, a few teams there on on a project. Um, I think it's a really good question where there are countries um, like Mexico where you're on like you know some like ninety nine point. 1% electricity access, um, but it still falls within um, discourses around access in a very simplistic manner that, you know, is it, do you have access to electricity? And that's kind of the end of the conversation. You know, clearly there's a need to think about the adequacy of supply as well. Um, and really to think about it in a, a very holistic sense of what is the role of energy for people's everyday lives and trying to to build up that much richer um, understanding of it. Um, I'll just stop that there. Yeah, I think we need to bring in questions around um, do people receive, you know, a power enough, a, a high enough kind of voltage supply to be able to run all the equipment that they want to? Do they suffer from lots of power cuts that makes it you know re impossible really to get a, a good quality service um, and do they have all of the equipment the energy services that they would need you know to kind of flourish and to have good health and well-being um, yeah they're really important questions and I think there's some important work happening around 
applying concepts like capabilities approach um, and thinking in a yeah, much wider sense um, beyond just that kind of, do they have electricity? How expensive is their energy and so on? I wanted to, to bring up that you've been working in a variety of roles around energy poverty. So um, the, the academic aspect is just one. You've been uh, running the Energy Poverty Observatory. Um, you've been uh, engaged in this uh, European Energy Poverty Network. And you've also been uh, very much in contact with, uh, with European level uh, policymakers. Um, what what has really changed in these last few years you've described some of the sort of specifics on countries and the sort of long running legacy but has there been a a shift of a really noticeable sort would you say given that it's uh, at least seems to be a, a phrase that's come up very much in uh, national policies now more than five years ago yeah absolutely the, i think the shifts have been huge um you know and we can really see that I like the concept of institutional thickening, um, where you know, kind of a policy issue suddenly gains like a lot of, of relevance and and a lot of um, institutions kind of behind it. And we've seen that with energy poverty, where uh, it was certainly discussed. You know, for many decades, um, there'll be European Parliament members from different countries would raise questions about it. The European Economic and Social Committee were really keen to have an observatory to have a definition um, and that was matched by civil society actors by academics all pushing for um, greater kind of action at the the European Union level um, I think what's been the big difference there is the European Commission completely changing its position on on the topic so before they you know flat out refused to do anything to to give any guidance to um, to measure the problem, to give any money for structural funding to, to improve um, the housing of the most vulnerable. Um, and it's something that um, where I've kind of talked to, to members of the European Commission team, um, you know, just to understand why they suddenly changed. Um, you know, we'd like to think it's because we, we lobbied them and, and gave them lots of compelling evidence on the health and well-being and moral reasons for addressing the problem. But of course, they're, they're completely aware of, um, of the issue. But what changed, I think, was the wider um, geopolitical context of the European Union. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on, on the EU to prove itself and its added value. So we've seen mishandlings of uh, the migration crisis, of um, you know, the Greek um, financial crisis, lots of areas where uh, criticism has been placed on on the European Commission's door and obviously with Brexit and, and the kind of fallout from that there are these huge questions around well what's the point of the European Commission and European Union structure um, and that really is has been a big driver for this focus on on practical action that actually makes a difference to people's lives so really cynically it, it, it's about um, the EU being able to prove its worth in an everyday sense for people to feel that difference they're seeing in their housing getting upgraded. Um, so while I maybe don't agree with the reasons why this shift change came about, I think it's it's fantastic that so much funding has been put in. You know, we've had three years of dedicated Horizon 2020 funding just for addressing energy poverty. Um, and something in the region of 10 million euros or more has gone to to practical projects to, to address the issue so yeah it's just i think it's really hard to quantify the the shifts that have occurred but they're just huge um but on a personal level i think the thing that's been most exciting has been going from you know when i started out in sort of 2010 in this research um there was me and maybe 10 other people across Europe that I could tell you did energy poverty research. And now um, with Engager and, and other networks, you know, there's hundreds of people um, across the whole of Europe who are working on it. And I think it's really invigorated the topic and brought so much richness to it that, yeah, that's definitely been the most fun aspect for it, I'd say. Um, 
other questions in the room. I have a, I have a bunch uh, at risk of, uh, of dominating um, proceedings um, um, here. I'd, I'd like to push you to talk a bit about what's happening elsewhere in the world outside Europe in relation to um, what you've said about uh, work on energy poverty in Europe and you're engaged in uh, in Latin America. I also noticed a recent comment in Nature Energy, perhaps you could talk us through that. Um, do you see do you see the developments here? You've indicated already with some really nice examples in your talk how the way that energy poverty manifests and the kinds of um, you know measures that might be needed to address it are vastly different even within Europe. But are there other varieties that that people are moving on elsewhere? That uh, is there cross learning happening, or is there scope for cross learning? Do you find it frustrating, or is it uh, heartening? Because you're kind of uniquely positioned to talk about this, being sort of really well linked up with multiple networks and um, have this embedded understanding within the European region. Yeah, it's a good question. Um... Let's start with the frustrations, I think. <laughs> um, I think I've, I've been working um, so with colleagues in, in Mexico, in Chile, um, Cuba and Colombia for the last kind of three years or so. Um, and I found it, you know, I've learned a lot along the ways around, um, I, I see a lot of scope for, for transference of knowledge around, you know, um, adaptation to cooling, um, extreme kind of how you how you manage living in extreme um, heat conditions that it doesn't seem is filtered through to to some of the European mindsets you know the way that uh, funding schemes for example are framed is always this kind of white savior model of um, a European university will go to to the global south and it will be like this one way transfer of knowledge uh, and nearly always that's how the, the funding schemes, at least for the UK, how they're kind of framed. And what I'd love to see is just that, you know, a move towards a two way exchange of knowledge and a recognition that it's not just um, one way, that there's, there's huge amounts that can be transferred back. Um, so I think that would be the, the main frustration that I encounter. Um, it feels kind of dishonest when you're putting together a funding application and you're having to kind of sell this particular narrative. Um, yeah, that would be good to change. Um, I think what's what I found intriguing um, is the sense that, at least within some of the Mexican dialogues, that it's almost at the stage of the UK in the 80s in the conversations around, you know, maybe moving towards privatizing, opening up energy markets. Um, and especially, you know, with, with also the drive towards increasing, um, you know, oil production, um, the, the investments that's ongoing in, um, in, in Dos Bocas um, oil refinery. Um, and also kind of the way in which government agencies who have engaged with talking about energy poverty have kind of gone to that early literature by Brenda Boardman and others and have applied the 10% uh, measure. So we've seen work by um, Kanui who do like a lot of energy efficiency work and they use the 10% um, Indicator. So it's this weird sense that there's these different parallel, different stages of where the discourse is at. So it would be really cool to see um, some of the, the last two years of dialogue on, on complexities or um, capabilities really um, emerging in sort of a Latin American context. Um, but that's not to say you know, there's not amazing people doing work there and you know learn a lot every day from from colleagues there so yeah I don't know if that in a long-winded way answers your question Sid. Very much so it was a very it was an unfairly broad question but <laughs> does uh, bring out the best thing sometimes. You, you didn't go into the the comment. Ah yeah that was an interesting one um, but maybe I'll go I don't know uh, Gibran, if you're just going to ask a question now, if I... um, no, you can comment. You're you're going to discuss about the commentary on in, in nature energy. Yeah. Um, so it was just a a fun piece actually, just to to. So I was asked to look at 
um, an article on um, a multidimensional approach to energy poverty within um, an Asian context. Um, and it struck me that there were quite a lot of parallels between some of the legal context or the legal issues that were, were happening there, particularly around subdivision of apartments um, and some of the, the gray areas of uh, regulating housing. And we see that in the UK with um, houses of multiple occupation, with um, houses, well, uh, living arrangements that fall outside of formal law protection. So people who live on, you know, canal boats or any kind of space that you can think of, in, especially in London, um, where it's a overheated accommodation market, we, we see those same dynamics happening. Um, but again, there was some really interesting learnings on um, excess heat, uh, the challenges with coping with a, an increasingly hot climate um, and, you know, what's the dangers of if we move towards using air conditioning? Um, so, yeah, it was a really fun piece to, to write. Um, I think it, it shows a kind of a broadening of, of the field. We are starting to see these new, um, new geographical focuses. Um, and I think that's really important that we kind of move away from quite a, a dominant European framing so far. Anyone yeah. Uh, okay. So this is just uh, you can just tell me what you think about this, uh, whether it's worth it or not. I, I work mostly with footprints, with life cycle, life cycle thinking and footprints, and uh, I'm just thinking that in our work there's always a direct component, like the energy used in the in the household, which is mostly what household poverty refers to, directly, you know, directly by the by the users. But when you think about energy footprints, there is a lot of energy embodied in the stuff we buy, which was energy that we didn't directly use, but it's embodied in, in all the things that we can purchase. And I was thinking, like, ultimately, that really decides the, <laughs> what you can do or the quality, I mean, not, not quality of life, but, uh, but the consumption of the total energy in, in the system. And I'm thinking whether including such a indirect energy into this energy poverty discussion, would it be beneficial or would it be just more confusing because there's already a lot to think about just in the direct aspect. So has, have you thought about it or do you think about it? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's not really something that I'm directly kind of doing in my work right now. Um, and they haven't said that um, I'm part of a small team at Birmingham working with some people in um, mechanical engineering who they're trying to develop um, basically an add-on for, for CAD um, where um, designers would be able to see the impacts of choosing like a particular material or, or um, you know, designing products in a certain way in terms of the social impacts it might have. So we're not sure how it will work out yet, but um, the idea is that like you say, a lot of things are just completely hidden away from, from us as consumers, from us as, you know, producers and users um, around, you know, if I, if I have a solar panel, this particular solar panel, um, how has the um, material been mined? Has it been in a, a context where there's not great safety standards? Um, so I think we do need to move in a general sense towards having that full understanding of the life cycle of a product and, you know, if we can move towards closed loop systems and recycling products, um, then that's just great in a in a general societal sense. I, I wonder what it would um, what it would produce, uh, what kind of information it would produce for for different levels of, of household income. Um, I would yeah. guess that you know there's an issue with low income households maybe um, buying products that are produced cheaply, and and that probably implies some trade offs with. Um, you know, maybe human rights standards or um, use of plastic, say. But, but yeah, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on, on what you're kind of expecting that might highlight. Yeah, for example, now that, now that you mentioned that, like, uh, I, I imagine, and this is almost in line with, with findings, is like, if you compare a rich household and a poor household, even in a rich country, uh, if, if you consider their total energy bill, energy footprint, including, you know, food, also like, you know, 
bananas or whatever also have some energy inputs there, right? Not only the solar panels and stuff, but basically everything, even watching Netflix, not even, not only the TV on your, on your home, but they embody the energy on that, for example. So normally poor households exert a larger percentage of their total footprint in direct energy and rich households uh, less and less, you know, most of their energy is through the stuff they bought on the market. And I'm just thinking whether, whether, you, yeah, consuming things on the market that use a lot of energy uh, can jeopardize actually the, the basic energy needs of the poor, poorest households, like something like that. But I don't know. I'm just, that's why I said like, no, no strings attached. I was just like yeah, yeah, no, thinking out loud and wanted to take the opportunity to hear what you guys think or you or anybody else. Yeah, it's interesting. And it makes me think actually around, um, I guess, at least in the UK, we've seen a very um, incremental policy set of policies to addressing energy efficiency and to addressing um, fuel poverty. So initially, the focus was on um, really getting that energy demand down from space heating, so improving um, uh, central heating systems and the efficiencies of those. So in general, um, you know, there's been huge reduction in energy demand from there. Um, then that kind of highlights, well, we use a lot of energy from lighting and then you know, there's been a lot of advancements in improving the efficiency of bulbs. Um, so I think we, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It kind of highlights where the gaps are um, that need to be addressed. And it makes me think in particular of a project in, um, in Belgium where they recognise that um, often vulnerable households have really old inefficient equipment so their fridges their washing machines and they're using a lot of electricity so they they've um partnered up it's a social worker who started it um stefan i forget his surname is it gromir i don't know if you remember sid um but he um he was a social worker and he saw a lot of these issues firsthand so he partnered up with i think it was bosch um to do like a really low cost rental system and they would hire out you know the newest um a rated uh, washing machine, fridge freezer, all the rest of it um, on a loan system and then they would do the repairs for free and they would just take away all of those kind of financial barriers that exist. Um, so there's some interesting examples and I don't know we see for example in Cuba where you know, obviously there's been extreme um, restrictions in place there uh, externally and you know they they out of necessity it's driven um, a culture of just being able to make products last for a really long time of, of building that expertise in repairing equipment. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, it's a really interesting question that you pose. And I think it's it's just that danger, isn't it, of, of demonizing a group who who probably out of this, yeah, out of they're not able to escape that situation of the way that the the purchasing habits occur or or the type of materials they're able to access. So that would be, I guess, my concern on the flip side. To me, this links with uh, what you brought up in your know, talk around flexibility and needs and uh, and practices around energy use. And, and that, of course, part of it is you could look at it in a consumption-based way, but also um, look at it outside the space of the home. And that's been uh, one of the, to me, very interesting developments lately in looking at uh, not only domestic energy poverty, but also transport energy poverty, which comes with its own sort of opportunities, um, but also kind of requirements for using certain kinds of measurements and those metrics and what they might look like are also kind of, there are open possibilities that are changing because of the way that we're decarbonizing systems and moving, you know, towards these social technical transitions. So is that something that you have thoughts on sort of like a priority one, two, three? Oh, tricky one. Um, I think one thing, that I've been really interested in, uh, uh, let's just do a bit more work on it, is um, I think these speeds of transition, almost like a traffic light system, I think, um, where there's, you know, the most able to pay richest households um, have, you know, steamed ahead with about to benefit from electric vehicles, from putting solar panels on their roof um, and getting lots of kind of tax incentives. You've got kind of like a middle class household who probably are benefiting from um, a greener electricity and gas provision 
through the grid in general terms and, and maybe are able to take advantage of certain um, low energy initiatives, able to buy kind of A-rated appliances and so on. But it's that group where I feel like they're going backwards, like on red, but actually just like rolling back down the hill. Um, you know, you're seeing in in a previous project that I worked on, um, led by uh, Stefan Bezrowski, we worked within Eastern and Central Europe and there were people who were having to go out and, and use you know, cut local firewood, um, even though it was illegal, within Hungary it's illegal to go and cut firewood, um, just necessity kind of made it that zone. Similarly, within the Western Isles of Scotland, um, peat cutting was pretty much um, gone and those practices around it had disappeared. But then, you know, in the last few years, especially since the financial um, recession, um, there's been this huge resurgence of it. And now people are um, gone back to the very traditional ways of making this particular kind of long spade to dig up the peat. Um, there's a lot of energy cultures around it. So I don't know, I feel so mixed about it because I feel on the one hand, it's, um, it's brought lots of generations together and sharing stories about energy and the place that they live. But it, it's just terrible on an environmental level um, to be burning peat. It's just like probably the worst thing you can do. Um, so yeah, I feel like there's different speeds and the transition just looks so different to, to different people, doesn't it? Thanks. I think that's a very fertile conversation and also a very nice point to kind of take with us. Um, if there are any questions uh, that haven't surfaced yet, let's give it a moment. Yes, I have a question, which um, I'm, um, I'm thinking something along the lines of, it, I haven't really defined this question properly, so I'm, I'm just trying to catch my <laughs> moment here. Um, but with, the, with this, this uh, problem that you were just referring to, um, for instance, burning peat, or the way that some people today are choosing to live um, more back to nature, in other respects. Um, I realized that searching for indicators for um, energy poverty um, could be in a way stigmatizing for certain people um, or for certain groups of people. And I'm wondering if there's another way of approaching it um, where today we're trying to find ways to go back to nature, to live more in, in, in harmony with nature in some respects, but on the other hand, burning peat is the worst thing we can do <laughs> for the environment. And there's, there's no harmony in that. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you have any thoughts further on this or if you've uh, moved into it uh, with your work or, or touched upon it in other ways but for myself I'm, I'm constantly trying to look for ways to reduce my own um, uh, ecological footprint um, but I do burn wood which luckily is not um, contradictory uh, in that sense, where I live. <laughs> um, but there are some issues there that make it complex uh, for many people to, to choose a lifestyle where you are, like you said, more in touch uh, with other people, the social context of, of, like they say, if you burn wood, you get warm twice while cutting it and while burning it. So you have other sides to that too. Thank you. I, I realize now there's not really a question there. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm a project of energy. I just want to add to this. So I do research with Pete, Pete region in Ireland. 
So it's a oh, big wow. issue, yeah. So issue there, and the other thing, like when I when I do community based research with the people living there and who have used peat for peat for hundreds of years, they say that okay, we are poor, like we're poor people. We're not the like you know urban people, and we are using peat, which is like we don't even co contribute to the global warming thing because we we use so much less energy and everything. And then you are asking us to stop using peat, which with which we have so much of cultural and historical kind of connection. So it's 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 really a very complex kind of a situation, like talking about like you know taking away the rights of the people to with they have with nature, and then again talking to them on topics like nature-based solutions and that those kind of things. It's it's really complex. So just my comment to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Um, and it, and it's something you know we we see time and time again that our relationships with the landscapes we we occupy and um, with the sources of energy we use are are deeply personal and and culturally driven. Um, and I think that's why um, so many policy initiatives have failed because there's been a very technical top down approach to thinking well. Um, this is the computer says this is the best um, uh, energy solution for where you live, the, the amount of wind or sunlight or anything else. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't match with how people really want to use energy. Uh, maybe there's a preference for a particular taste of food if it's cooked with different um, fuels. Um, or, you know, in certain parts of the world, particular types of wood hold a, a very important symbolic religious um, meaning. So I think what it all points to is, is that need to, um, to consider things um, in their entirety of linking together um, different social factors with the technical um, perspectives. Um, and for example, it's something that we're, we're trying to do in, in a project. Um, it's an 18 month project, somewhat uh, challenged by, <laughs> by COVID, for, but basically our, our approach was to be, um, to match up exactly that, the social and technical. So we, our plan is to, um, to hold quite a lot of participatory workshops with uh, communities to work through the different energy issues that exist at community and a household level. Um, and to, to gain understanding of how uh, energy is used, so a lot of kind of energy diaries and things like that. And then in conjunction with um, our engineering teams, our renewable engineering teams, kind of coming with a portfolio of options that might work, working through with the householder, talking to them what it might mean, and then making that decision together. Um, so we're hoping that that will result in um, kind of a practical toolkit that can be replicated in other spaces and approach to, to how to initiate those discussions, um, how to talk through, you know, different energy technologies, um, and ultimately, you know, how to support households with taking on board new practices. Because often that is, as you know from your work as well, I'm sure that that follow-up stage is often missing as well, um, that people aren't given enough aftercare support um, and so certain habits don't necessarily get embedded and or technology doesn't get used um, in maybe the most optimal way. So yeah, I think it's, um, we, are, we need to do a lot more to, to complexify things. <laughs> Great, I think uh, it's time to draw to a close and uh, I wanna thank Harriet for taking the time to give us a fantastic talk and um, and to everybody who's uh, engaged in the discussion, we do have um, three more um, get-togethers uh, left this year, coming up the next three weeks, and uh, you'll see the themes on the website. But uh, thanks again, and this will be up online if you want to go back to some of the thoughts that have surfaced. Great, thanks everyone. Really great questions. It was good to to hear about some of the work that uh, other people have going on as well. 